Yeah. 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 I do the 22nd. Yeah. Earlier in the hood, I mean, it was like 8 o'clock. Oh. Like, this is not great. The internet went out like somewhere in the middle of the uh, Excuse me, it's 2 o'clock. Okay. Okay. okay, so this works out good for you. <laughs> Meeting's coming to order. Right. Welcome back in person. Yes. We are excited to see everybody, or at least the whites of your eyes. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to start with an approval of the minutes from the March 12th Public Art and Design Board minutes. So, uh, I move to approve the minutes. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And it's approved. Um, are there citizens here to be heard regarding items not on the agenda? <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, actually, we do. <laughs> All right. She walks in right at the you right time. Right at the right time, Beth. Right at the right time. Great. I'm going to bring up your two uh, photos here. Probably better at maneuvering. I'll come through as you need it. So, uh, there we go. Beth Daniels uh, from the Clearwater Arts Alliance. Uh, as you know, some months ago we came and uh, applied to y'all for a portion of some of the discretionary funds that you have uh, for public art. Uh, that was last fall. That got approved uh, and took a while to get things kind of organized and off the ground, but I wanted to give you an update. For neighbor, if you recall, after some Adjustments, we ended up with trying to first focus on some underserved neighborhoods where they didn't have many art amenities. And then, we, you know, some six total boxes can be done. Uh, four neighborhoods have already put their hand up and applied and been approved. And two are underway fully. Uh, you'll see the original is up. Elizabeth Arenas was picked by the neighborhood. So there was a collaboration process. The neighborhood decided what kind of a subject they wanted due to uh, the fact that several people in their neighborhood raise butterflies. Uh, and this is the Milton Park neighborhood. This box will be at the corner where the Lakeview dead ends down into Lake Bellevue, uh, at uh, Lakeview and uh, South Myrtle. So that original has been created. It's been digitally copied in real high res. That's been shared with the installer. And this is the proposed layout face by face of the four faces of the box. And uh, that's due to be literally installed probably next week. It took a little extra time, but they have cleaned off. There were some areas around the box that were very overgrown, and the median was got you know a lot of weeds and all. So Parks and Rec came out, cleaned all that up, ready for install. Uh, one of the other uh, first groups that um, that uh, was um, applied and was selected was the Skycrest neighborhood. And after collaboration with their neighborhood, they picked artist Beth Warmath. And this is not... We've got some up on um, yeah. so you don't have to... Yeah, turn you don't have to your neck, your neck quite <laughs> yeah. so hard. Uh, so it's not, uh, that is not totally complete, but it's mostly complete. They chose the subject of the gladiola fields because historically that entire neighborhood was a giant gladiola farm all the way through the 30s and 40s and into the 50s. Uh, if you went out Cleveland to about Lake, and beyond, that those fields were all out in that area. So they chose that historical subject, and that's what's being produced. So uh, those artists have been paid or partly paid so far. We will be installing shortly. Uh, the other two neighborhoods that have been approved are, um, excuse me, Spring Branch, which is up off of North Betty. Um, they, they are kind of in a holding pattern because of huge redo of the whole intersection in which the signal box sits for the redo of a bridge and a road is underway and they don't want to take a chance. They get something new in and then, you know, a backhoe or something would bash it over. So, so they're underway but not uh, complete yet. And then also Lake Bellevue was suggest selected on their application and they have decided that they will use artist Beth Warmath, but due to the virus they haven't been able to have an HOA meeting to decide their subject and to collaborate on the design. But, uh, so those, they're all moving ahead at, at various stages, us pushing them along, you know, everything virtual meeting-wise, but 
very successful so far. And um, I just got an email today that Juliana sent out will be four of what we believe the money will cover for six. She sent the notice out to the larger neighborhood group to see who puts their hand up to be the last two. But the first four all will be in underserved areas that don't presently have art amenities. Yes. So that's our report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Guys. I'll certainly answer any questions if you have. Them. No, I got a question. The, uh, the and you, you said you digitally uh, did the butterfly one previously, and you'll do the same thing with this one. Digital, take a digital image and then do. Yeah, the yeah. That none of them are painted on the box. They never oh, have. So they can it's be a done. wrap. It's a vinyl wrap. And the artist part of our agreement is in order to get paid, they have to produce a high resolution digital image that they share with the installer because the boxes are not entirely uniform. There's grates and there's, you know, uh, handles and, and the hinges that all have to be accounted for and all. But we get a digital layout so that you can visualize, well, how would, how would this actually fit to best take advantage of the art? And interestingly, unlike our first several phases where we kind of picked artists' images that were bright and colorful and abstract or whatever, just they're already produced, we're paying them for the right to use it. These were produced to go on these particular boxes, so they sized their originals so that you get the effect of it fitting around. You don't just get chops of it. You get, as if it was a design to go around the corners and to communicate around the whole box. So that's another sort of good thing that came about to an original being created for these particularly already measurable spots. Awesome. Anyway, fine. Thank you. One more. Yeah. <laughs> this, my daughter probably asked this question. Um, are those, are those a indigenous species of butterflies? Don't laugh, please. They're in my garden. Yep. The uh, one's monarch. a zebra long wing. Zebra long wing and the monarch. Yeah. And monarchs. Yeah. So they're they're native to Florida. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. And if you put things like milkweed plants in your gardens, you will increase your yep. your attraction for them because that's their natural food. So I know because I just had a bunch of. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Terrific. And that's all we have for citizens to be heard regarding items not on the agenda. So. Uh, moving on to new business items. Um, oh. Ready? Yep. All right. Well, before we start, welcome back. Uh, it's good to see you all again. Thank you for coming here in person. This is one of the first in-person meetings the city has had since opening up into phase two of uh, reopening the state. So we will figure more things out as we go along. Hopefully we'll have um, less reason to worry in the future. Um, you know, we can only hope that we get back to more of a normal, normal life than a new normal life. Um, so the first item of business is to appoint a public art and design board member to the Sculpture 360 Season 10 Selection Panel. And we'll just take a volunteer from the group if you're interested in participating. Jonathan, all right. Okay. What, do you want? Oh, I'll be in there. Okay. So, what's that? Please. You, you, okay. So we'll, we'll need to choose one since we're a public board. Brand new. Whatever you want. Six feet apart. Doesn't matter. Any meaning money more. There you go. You got okay. it. Okay. All right. Great job. Okay. Jonathan. Ready to go early. Thanks. Congratulations. <laughs> Jonathan, we'll have you on our selection panel. Um, and we will, uh, actually my next item is uh, for discussing the schedule. Uh, but before we get there, the other members of the panel are Amanda Thompson from our CRA, uh, Lena Teixeira from our Downtown Clearwater Merchants Association, uh, Rosemary Damore is our Public Relations Program Manager, and Linda Rothstein is our Assistant Director of the Library. So those will be our representatives for this round. And we like to change it up every uh, other year or so to make sure that we're getting uh, new eyes, but new people participating in the program. And they become advocates for the program. OK, um, any questions on that item? OK, uh, we'll move on to 4.2, is review the updated timeline for Sculpture 360 Season 10. Well, due to the virus, uh, we had originally intended to put out the call to artists in March. Um, the city shut down soon after our meeting. That was on March the 12th. So that sort of uh, put a pin and a delay in the, the process. Um, 
what I have uh, created here is a catch-up schedule for us. Um, what we would do is that uh, July 16th, the Call to Artists closes. After that, um, the week... What closes? The Call to Artists. The Call to Artists. Call to Artists, uh, yeah. Um, after that, the, the following week, we would review the artwork uh, as part of the panel, so that would be the week of July 20th. The following week after that, we would uh, see if the Public Art Board can get back together for a off-session meeting to keep things moving along. That would be the week of July 27. Uh, the following week after that, we would uh, notify and select the shortlisted artists to see if they are continuing to be available to sort of lock them in and give them a heads up. Uh, they wouldn't be told they've been selected for the program, but rather that they're on the shortlist. Uh, it's pretty common to do in the field just to make sure people are available. Um, after the, right during that week, we would add the item to the council's agenda for a council meeting on August the 20th. The council would review the artwork. If all things go well, August the 24th, the artist would be contracted and then installations would begin uh, and finish by the end of September. So with a compressed schedule, uh, that gets us back up to speed with only a month of delay in between. Um, what I've talked to the remaining artists of Sculpture 360 Season 9 is that they would be open to extending their loan of works uh, for the remainder of the time period until September or early September. Um, one of the artists did take out their piece early. Uh, they were concerned with the unrest happening in our area. He pulled out all of his artwork uh, throughout uh, multiple cities and municipalities. He actually wound up picking three art pieces up the day that we took this one out. It was my first Monday back to the office, so mm -hmm. it was kind of a scramble to get it. But we were able to help him. And uh, the other two remaining artists, which are Gaia, the head that you see on Cleveland Street, and then in a musical atmosphere is the uh, guitar that's near the Capitol Theater. They're both open to extending their loan. What we would do is my suggestion is to offer them a prorated amount in the same percentage of the original loan. So that would be $500 for three months for an extension of that. Uh, and so what I would do is uh, I would ask if there's any questions before we move on to that, but um, I would want to make sure that uh, the board was okay and we would, I would ask for approval to uh, access the public art funds to pay them the, the $500 each. Here, yes. I have a question. What I heard was the call was about to go out in March when the city shut down, and then what I heard was that the call, call will close on July 16th. Has the new call gone out, or when will the new call go out? The new call goes out this week, or okay. actually the call goes out this week. Okay. So we have a month of time that it'll be out to the artists. Gotcha. And is that going out on Cafe Press? We won't do it on CAFE. We'll be doing our partner organizations simply because we have to pay a $1,000 licensing for each round of CAFE that we use. Oh, okay. So um, looking because this is such a small budget project, we don't want to put so much of the budget towards listing. Uh, so what I do is list it on uh, Americans for the Arts. I list it on the Public Art Network here in Florida and then share with our, um, our team agencies, Creative Pinellas, the Arts Alliance, uh, Hillsborough County Arts Council, uh, to disseminate it out from there. Okay. And because we are working just with Florida artists this year, we want to make sure that it stays in the state. It'll go further than that if by sharing it with the Public Art Network, um, but it's just open to Florida residents this year. I got one more question, Chris. Yes. So, so, the, so the loan would go for just the extra month of time for the existing sculptures? Well, the existing sculptures should be coming out this month. Uh, per the contract that was originally done. Um, but I'm trying to make sure that we don't have empty pads out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Thank you. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And, then, and then for the, for the uh, season 10, would 10 start when that was finished or completed in the end of what, was October? 12? September. September. Yep. So then that would be another 12-month round. We'll that. do 18 months from there. Okay. 18 months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just to get a little more extension out of the program. No, I got you. So that makes sense. So it should just basically shifts all that, and then we just pick up the extra time and give them the money for the extra loan of leaving their structures in place. Correct. Okay. Makes sense. 
Do we need a vote on that? Um, yeah, I would ask for a motion. Okay, well, I motion to fund the, uh, the extra uh, dollars associated with that based on the appropriated amount for the risk. Second, for sure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So be it. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll get on that and we'll get cracking. Hey, Chris, thank you for doing that because uh, oh, well, I don't want to leave that vacant downtown. You know? Yeah. Downtown has a hard enough time as it is right now. Right, exactly so. Our work really does make a big difference down there. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. We want to make sure, you know, at this time that we're trying to encourage more folks to come back downtown and use restaurants. Uh, with uh, Coincidentally, with the street closure uh, for outside dining, those two artworks are the ones that are in the street closure zones. So, sound good? Okay, um, review staff recommendations for the placement of public art at Crest Lake Park. Well, in the time that I was working from home, I was checking up with my projects, and uh, I wanted to check up on this one to see where the construction was at and what the process was happening. And so I wrote to uh, Parks and Recreation and the project designers, and I said, you know, how's everything going? Are we still on board for, are we still on target for the uh, uh, splash pad that we had discussed out there? And they said, oh, well, we thought about the splash pad, and we were looking at safety and maintenance concerns, and they said, well, we don't recommend the splash pad anymore. I said, okay. Um, <laughs> so that changes things up a little bit. Uh, nothing if not um, life-changing constantly. Uh, but what they've recommended are two things to consider. And I've, I've really given these a lot of thoughts over the last couple of weeks, and I think they would work well for the park. Uh, one possibility would be a discovery trail of smaller artworks that would be stationed throughout the park that could be almost a scavenger hunt or a seek and find uh, for visitors and especially families to you know look at them as they move around. Um, they would be situated along the path uh, that circles the lake. And I'll just bring up a little image here. Uh, this is Crest Lake as uh, we've seen it before the construction, uh, but the pathway that circles the lake would be um, is a nature pathway. Uh, and it would be a good spot for installing these sculptures around that area. The second possibility is to design a standing, uh, freestanding artwork for the site. Um, we could locate it, it in an area that is heavily trafficked. Um, the areas here coming off of uh, South Glenwood is a major entry into the park. Uh, it's uh, people enter and link up with the trail. Another uh, potential is this area down to the southwest is where the dog park is. Uh, it's one of the most heavily utilized areas of the park. Um, and so in the initial um, feedback for the project planning of the uh, redesign of the park, they learned that, uh, number one, dog park is the tops on people's lists for this. Uh, but also uh, the natural beauty of the park is something that people really appreciate. And so the trees, the flora and fauna, uh, bird watching, um, you know, looking at the turtles in the pond are something that's really uh, important to the residents that live around the park as well as the users. And so it's my recommendation that we look towards those two things to serve as our uh, themes for the, uh, the call to artists for this particular project. I'll be going to a project updating meeting, or project update meeting with Parks and Rec and the designers next Wednesday. We're going to walk through the site and uh, take a look at some potential areas to actually site those locations and tag them uh, that we'd be able to put out sort of a joint call to artists to see what artists come back with as far as projects that they've done in the past that would be similar. Um, and I think I, whichever, which either one we go with uh, would be a, a nice interpretation of artwork out there. We've got 64,000 in this project. So um, whether it's a, an assemblage of smaller pieces or one larger and a couple smaller, we could work through a few different options with that. Um, if there are any things that you'd like me to bring to that meeting as far as comments or questions that I can ask Parks and Rec of the designers, please let me know. I'm happy to do that as you know, we search for something that would work well at the park. I do have a question. Um, I, I mean, I, I consider it art. You guys think about a fountain added for the water quality in there? Just don't laugh. A lot of cities you go to have the fountains and stuff. You guys are, you know, talking about mm -hmm. they have lights and stuff. 
an artist design fountain would qualify. Yeah. Um, the, the difficult thing with that is we want to make sure that with any fountain that we put in the park, it has enough filtration in it that it's not going to clog up quickly. So we don't want it to be a, a maintenance, um, ongoing maintenance thing that we'll have to keep going out there and fixing. Um, but it is a potential. Bring it up? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But, you know, the maintenance guys got to have something to do over there. That's, that's <laughs> true. The park does keep them pretty busy. They, they, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Yes. Um, do you did you find out when the change in the splash pad element was made? Was that something recent, or has it been percolating for a while? I think it's been uh, percolating for a little bit, but I found out about it in May. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it took me asking them about it to have them tell me, um, which I wouldn't prefer, but uh, that's sort of yeah, how the that, dice that's, fell. <laughs> that's along the line where I was going. Yeah. Um, with the familiarity of the Morningside mm -hmm. um, results. Right. It, it appears that we're not ingraining with staff, with public work staff or construction staff. Yeah. We're trying to get on the front side of these decisions to integrate art into the project. Right. And decisions are being made during the process that are excluding our original design sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that conversation needs to happen with staff. And yes. I know I get all of the logistics. Sure. Uh, but there's funding going into these projects and commitments going into these projects and, you know, why are we doing what we're doing if they're going to be decided out of the projects? Right. That makes perfect sense, especially, you know, when we we want to avoid anything like Morningside happening again to where we have to completely re retool. If it's part of the discussion at the beginning, that's something that, that we can plan for. That's right. Yeah. We make a decision and right. collectively we, we know that. But, yeah, I appreciate that if yes. you can bring that I will. Or use our board as the hammer to mm -hmm. ensure that other departments are including you in that decision. Yes. Thank you. I love both ideas. I'm visualizing cool sculptures of dogs with water coming out of their mouths, potentially, <laughs> um, at the dog park. And I'm or also... Or the other if the goal is to get people from the neighborhood and from outside the neighborhood to go and spend more time in the park, mm -hmm. um, uh, scavenger hunt, education, tree knowledge, um, animal knowledge, uh, stations around the lake. Is anybody else besides me focused on the fact that this lake is the shape of a heart? Mm -hmm. yeah, it does look like yeah. yeah. Yeah, just needed to mention that. Um, it, there's a healthy budget, but... Uh, if you have multiple things, then you have to make sure that it's it's safe, it's not vandalized, it's large enough to have impact um, and readability, but and not be able to be taken away. So those are the things that are turning my head. There's no comment. There's no question. I just wanted to share. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I was looking at, and I'll just bring it up uh, here. This, uh, I don't know if it's showing up over there. Make it bigger. <laughs> this little guy here uh, is probably about three feet tall uh, and sits, is actually integrated into the bench um, in the New York subway. And a number of them were stationed all throughout the subway that people could discover as they went through. It's of a size that's not pocketable, essentially. Uh, it would be difficult to go uh, walk and away with it. too, probably. It, heavy, yes, absolutely. Um, and it's integrated into the uh, amenity at the site, too. So that makes it even more difficult to walk off with it. So, you know, this can be some of that thought as we're moving into it, um, you know, making sure that our pieces remain out there uh, and that they don't walk off. Yeah, I could see something like that being a real draw to, to bring people in and enjoy the beautiful, because it's a beautiful space, mm -hmm. and all the way around. Yeah, yeah it's is, all the way around. Yeah. Is, and few, well, it took me a long, 
a long time to live here before I made it all the way around. I hang it like that. Any other comments? All right. Well, I'll take that information. Um, I'll make sure to uh, have that dialogue with them about making sure we're part of the communication chain so that we can stay up to date. If something changes, it changes. That That is part of it, but mm -hmm. we're at the early outset of it that we're able to adapt our, you know, adapt our thinking to it and be part of that conversation rather than it being just told to us we're not going to use this anymore. Right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, next up is review a staff report on public art programming in response to COVID-19 and social distancing practices. So we have a whole new uh, way of thinking about things now, and uh, meeting in person is gradually coming back, but for a while there, it looked like it would be a long time before we see uh, groups of people again. Um, with that, the CRA, Cultural Affairs, and the Clearwater Arts Alliance have partnered together to do a downtown interactive map of arts and cultural amenities. So what we would do is build on the success of what the Arts Alliance has done with their downtown walking tour and digitize that. Um, we would grab all the resources we have from different areas of uh, the city as far as what's been done previously, uh, photographs, interviews, videos, and coalesce them all into a downtown uh, interactive map that people could view online or they could view it on their mobile uh, device and walk through and find out information either doing their own tour or incentivizing uh, and interesting people in participating in an in-person tour. Uh, so that is in the process now. It looks like probably within four weeks, I think, we'll see um, that website up and running. Um, and we'll be able to support the Arts Alliance in their mission of bringing more uh, arts tours downtown and really getting the word out. Now, what's great about this is that it's scalable, too. Once we get downtown, we can look at broadening out to incorporating the remainder of the city, and into um, incorporating the county's collection as well as some of the private development that's uh, done outside of the public art program of uh, just some of the older pieces that were done, like Sun Time at the corner of Missouri and Drew Street, and really capture a lot of the um, things that have been part of our community for a long time. Uh, so this is something we're really excited about doing. Um, and we're working with the designers that have done the uh, downtown Clearwater website. So we'll be able to share it with the Arts Alliance, link back and forth uh, between one another, and really have our organizations support one another in getting people interested in what's out there and available to see. Yes, Neil. Um, I applaud you for, for that effort. I think it'll go a long way um, uh, to get information out while people are interested in downtown, uh, being able to um, self-tour or, or um, gain information, you know, on, on uh, the, the uh, individual art piece and the program. I'm, uh, I'm interested or would uh, suggest to you to also investigate app-based deliveries. Okay. Um, I know of a few that um, uh, in St. Pete in their mural program, mm -hmm. uh, where it is just a downloadable free app that will give you a video. Obviously, there's production um, needs in that, but it will explain the art piece to you mm -hmm. as a user on an app standing in front of the art piece. Yeah. And I think as we evolve, that is probably um, where everybody is going, or 
certainly my kids are are going. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not delivered via this website is one thing, but if it's not delivered immediately, um, you know, yeah, we're, we may be missing something. So I'll I'll be glad to share some uh, information that I have on it. Thank you. Um, and something else to follow up with that is that the Shine Festival got a grant to um, do audio tours um, of you know audio descriptions for sight impaired people to help mm -hmm. make it more accessible to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a resident, um, and I, I won't mention the um, the app, but it's a St. Pete app developer. Okay. Um, who. Um, I was looking for it for use in the St. Pete 2050 vision plan as some mechanism of um, self-guided information about history of St. Pete. And, uh, but there is production needs in that that's more so than just a website based of content that, you know, is mapping that is already available. So That would be great. The more that we can remove as far as obstacles to people using it, yeah. Uh, the better of you know if they're able to take it with them around through the city and, and not have to click through a website all, all the better. So I will, uh, I will yeah, work with that. you and, and investigate that even further. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask the question, but you kind of answered it of um, making sure that it goes outside of downtown as well as over to the beaches because there's so many great murals, there's so much great artwork. Um, that's outside, and, and that's any way that we can promote that is good. Yep. Yeah, we wanted to, uh, well, the CRA is funding this section of it, so it started off there, which is great that we'll be able to partner with it on, with them on this. Um, but yes, the plan is to expand and, and get the entire collection of the city uh, to really uh, capture everything that we've gotten. It can serve as a repository for past works as well. As we go through future uh, seasons of Sculpture 360, we can have a library of what came before and still maintain all of that information. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Uh, well, actually, I was thinking, I think Beth had mentioned before uh, the Clearwater Arts Alliance had done, they already have their own map that they were just going to update. Seems like several months ago or several meetings ago where she was at. They do have a map, and I think, Beth, you've got yeah, some. Yeah, she's got some paper copies of it. Um, it's. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Awesome. So we're building off of that concept idea, um, and the company that does the work for downtown Clearwater has a similar frame of the map already that we'll be able to drop um, information into as where you hover over with a mouse, or if you click it, it brings up the uh, details of the sculpture. So essentially taking what the Alliance has done with their map and then uh, making it a more digital, interactive Stop. Anybody else need one? I think I came out a couple weeks ago. You, you did. We, we may have changed the color on the front a little bit or something, but the concept is the same. Anybody else need one? Mike. So, is there an estimated ballpark time of launch? And I know that these kinds of things, you always plan to soft launch at a certain time, and then in the back of your mind, you say, yeah, and we'll add a month. Sure. But um, We're hoping for July 4th week that okay. we can get you know, a lot of people that are moving around for the holiday anyway. Uh, and so it's in process already, um, and that uh, we're looking to move it along as quickly as possible. That's fabulous. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks. And, uh, you know, as, as we move further in, and as, as the city right now, we're not producing any of our own events. Um, because of the COVID-19 shutdown. But as we get back into programming, we're going to be doing, uh, in the meantime, more virtual uh, offerings of uh, you know, entertainers and things to encourage people to come downtown or to see downtown uh, and expand that back into physical programming when it starts to make sense again. OK. <clears throat> Um, here is my long section. This is the uh, third quarter update on fiscal year 2019-2020 public art and design program annual plan. So I wanted to give you sort of a mid-year update on where we are, uh, give you an outlook as to what projects are in process, what's on the horizon, and what's on the far horizon so that we're starting uh, at the very early sections and integrating our work into um, the designs of the project rather than coming in uh, outside of that. 
So um, current projects that we're working on right now, Crest Lake Park is previously updated. Um, Imagine Clearwater, I will get into uh, greater detail in its own item, which is our next item after this. One of the projects that uh, has been done already, but I wanted to circle back around to, is the East Library. Uh, this is the Reaching for Knowledge sculpture that's done by Gus and Lena Ocampasilva. That's at uh, the East Library, St. Petersburg College, Drew Street campus. Um, it's sort of on the corner, uh, fronts Drew Street, but it's near Old Coaching Road. There's no lighting uh, for that piece. And so I've worked uh, with the library to uh, take some project funding that uh, the library had in their budget uh, to contract with a provider to get some lights out there. Uh, so I was working on that uh, before we closed, and I'm uh, resuming working on that now that we're back. And so lighting will be installed very soon out there, uh, so people will be able to see that piece at night. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't know how that was missed originally, but we're making sure that it's being corrected now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next up is something that I'm working on, actually uh, have a meeting tomorrow about it, is the Clearwater Gas Building. That's on uh, Myrtle, just north of the train tracks. It's a really large project. Uh, this is one of our catch-up projects that was initiated uh, in the time that I was with Creative Pinellas and coming back here. Um, the public art budget for this one is $200,000. Uh, and so I'm meeting on site with the assistant director of the gas department to see what's available as far as uh, sites to integrate artwork there. This will be a post-construction uh, project there. Uh, but I think there are some opportunities out on the site to take advantage of the uh, public amenities that they have and enhance them. Um, this is also potentially a source of uh, discretionary fund budget if we find that uh, we can't, or it's not, if it's not feasible or not the, the best use of, of the entire budget, we can take some of those funds and transfer them into the discretionary fund while still having a public art impact out on the site, sort of a best of both worlds scenario. Um, so that's a number of things that I'll be discussing with them tomorrow and uh, can report back to you in our July meeting as to you know, what's going on with that and advance that process forward, uh, get some action out on that site. Uh, next up is another catch-up project, is the Seminole Boat Docks. Um, this, I'm working with engineering to determine what their allocated budget was for the project. Uh, this is on uh, Alternate 19 uh, near Francis Wilson Playhouse, uh, up on the north side of the city, kind of near uh, North Ward Elementary. Um, and this project was uh, is going to be completed uh, very soon. The only thing that's uh, up for debate right now is a restroom facility out on the site. Um, but we're looking in the potential of doing a large artist design sign out at the area, uh, at the site that would tell people this is a seminal boat dock and incorporate that uh, into the infrastructure there. Um, so once I find out uh, what the public art budget for that project is, I'll come back to you and let you know. It's uh, something that I've been working on for a little bit and still waiting on some more details. Uh, additionally, we've got Sculpture 360 Season 10. Uh, we've got a CRA mural project, Phase 2. Uh, the CRA is funding two to four additional murals in the CRA core. That is basically the waterfront to Highland and uh, Drew Street to Chestnut. And so anything in that corridor uh, could be considered. We've developed a list of about 15 sites that we're working with property owners to see if they would be willing to have a mural on their site. Um, it's funded by the CRA, and the requirement is that the uh, business owner keeps the mural in place for five years. Uh, the CRA will maintain the piece if it needs it over that five-year period, and then the maintenance would transfer to the business owner after that. Um, and so they've had couple of pieces that they've already done as part of the first phase project, notably uh, the one on the Garden Avenue garage, uh, which is going to get some AR, uh, uh, augmented reality programming that's uh, happening through USF, a uh, partnership over there. Uh, you'll actually be able to see the mural move and change. Um, 
This one is called Comunidad, and it uh, has some ladies that are linking hands. And they've actually worked it to where the, um, the figures will dance or move in different ways across the, uh, the mural. So we're looking at potentials of integrating that into our, our new program as well. Um, there's a couple sites that uh, we're looking at in particular uh, in this downtown core. One of them, notably, is the Station Square Park Garage. Uh, which is an area that uh, you know more and more events will be happening there, and it would be a wonderful backdrop to have as we uh, you know look at people moving into the park uh, to be able to see a nice mural in the background there, uh, you know, and and uh, sort of show off some more artwork that we've got here in the city. Um, another one is the Nolan Apartments. Uh, we're working with the owners there. There are two buildings, Building A and C, uh, that front Prospect Avenue, um, and they have huge 70-foot tall um, surfaces there that we'd be able to uh, have some murals on the side. And we got a, um, prior to us working on it, we had a, a mural company from Tampa approach us with some ideas for the site, uh, but we'll have to do a call to artists to make sure that we have a, basically an open process uh, but the images that they gave us are really uh, exciting, and we're encouraging them to submit through the call to artist process. Uh, that'll be done in probably about two weeks once we get confirmation from two more sites so that we can have five sites in the call. Um, but some of the others are there's a warehouse that fronts the Pinellas Trail uh, that's just a little bit to the north of Gulf to Bay. Um, it's a big, basically, white box building uh, sort of catty corner to the police office. Uh, we also have uh, the Ultimate Medical, Medical Academy building uh, that's on Cleveland Street. They're interested in the gigantic east facade that they have as that you see as you're moving into downtown. Um, it's right before you get into the Nature's Food Patch uh, parking lot. It's a five-story building uh, that's about half a block long, and they're interested in uh, sort of sprucing up that side of the building as well. Very exciting. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Clearwater. That would be a very big mural. Very good. <laughs> um, the, there's uh, up to $20,000 of funding each project. Uh, so we'd be able to get you know, a fairly sizable mural. Um, and if there's a smaller project, we'd be able to transfer some of the funds over into that one as well to further augment it with CRA funding. Uh, some future projects, th those are sort of ongoing projects that I'm working on now. Uh, some future projects that we've discussed before, uh, the Police District 3 substation that's out at Countryside. Um, they are uh, moving towards trying to get a construction manager for the uh, design build out at that uh, site. And so I'm, uh, they're actually choosing them on June 26th. So once that's decided, and I've actually uh, spoken with the project manager, we're going to get in early with them and see what we can do out at that site. Uh, in my calculations, it looked like we were going to get about 110000 for that project. Uh, so that would be a sizable uh, piece of artwork that could either be uh, relocated near the large intersection of 580 and McMullen Booth, uh, which is sort of just on the outskirts of where the facility is, if it's... Uh, determined that you know we want a more public facing uh, art investment for that project. Uh, it's also something that might be a collaboration that we could work with Pinellas County Schools being close to uh, Countryside High just right across the street. Uh, so just sort of daydreaming some possibilities for that project. Uh, additionally, we have uh, Fire Station 46 uh, that I'll be meeting with Wanamaker Jensen soon uh, to identify some potential locations. This is the Beach uh, Mandalay uh, Station. They're actually going to tear down the old facility, build a new facility half a block to the south of uh, the existing one. So <laughs> it's uh, actually, let me show you on the map here. So at Mandalay Park, we've got the existing fire station that's right up here, uh, just kind of across from the Palm Pavilion. They're going to be moving that down here. Why? Do not know. Um, I think it has to do <laughs> with... Staging. Yeah. 
Are they going to build the new one before they demo the old one? The old one. Yeah, it's always cheaper to. Do, it's sometimes fun, more cost effective to work that way. As weird as it may sound. Yeah. <laughs> and, building, and keeping an operating fire station all at the same time because they yeah, do that up at the I can't side. imagine what it's like to have a building diagonal to the corner and try to get the fire trucks in and out of it. Yeah. I mean, I that's a really awkward parking lot. Their access out here is to Bay Esplanade, uh, which is kind of, they've got to make a big turn uh, to get back over to Mandalay. I think potentially this one, they could either go right out onto the street or come onto Rockaway. Um, but uh, what uh, I was talking with the chief about is this is one of the most heavily publicly uh, front-facing of any of the stations here in Clearwater. And so the firefighters are really excited about having some artwork out there that they'll be able to show and talk to the public about. Uh, and so this is something that I think uh, will be, um, well, number one, uh, well seen, uh, but number two, something that will get a lot of buy-in from the, uh, the host agency uh, in the fire station of getting it up and out there and being um, proactive about where it's uh, installed and located. Um, and then far future projects. There's a fire station 47. Uh, that's the relocating of the east side station that's near um, Clearwater High right now in that neighborhood. They're going to be building a new station out there um, to be determined you know, when that comes around as far as design uh, and the process of that. But that's something that I'm keeping my eye on. Uh, additionally, a new city hall building, whenever that uh, project <laughs> takes process, uh, between now and the remaining next uh, 100 years, we may <laughs> celebrate our bicentennial uh, by the time we see one. Uh, but also, uh, the Clearwater Marina boat slips renovation, uh, we're going to see um, some project funds coming from that project uh, that will be able to have some more artwork incorporated out there. So those are the short but long list of projects that we're working on. Um, wow. You're busy. I am going to be very busy. Uh, and with, uh, I think, District 3 substation and Fire Station 46 will be coming online as far as design or at least the, the getting the ball rolling within the next six months. So it will be a, a stacking plates game as far as uh, keeping up with some of the uh, catch-up projects, but it's going to be good to be busy. Yes. Can I, can I ask a question about the arrival? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, that's yeah. actually your call. You'll need, you know, okay. need to stand where you are. You'll need to get six feet away. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh, ask a question about the murals, because obviously yeah, Arts right. Alliance is very <laughs> interested in that aspect of it, and I wanted to let you know, because uh, I'm not exactly clear on the boundaries of the CRA, but the Historical Society, which we are trying to do some partnering with and working with, is very, very interested in the mural. As you know, the, the front part right on Fort Harrison is open. That's the original, you know, um, I guess Clearwater Elementary or whatever, but the original high school is about, you know, is just behind that. It's not directly behind it, it's kitty corner behind it. And there's a huge wall that faces Fort Harrison. They're very interested in a mural going on that, which um, we are going to try to partner with them in terms of helping them understand how to do a call to artists and all those kinds of things, Pro probably helping them put together a request at all. The one little wrinkle which we need to think about is I know that they're, they're in the CRA and they're not because actually the school board owns the property. So that's a little, they lease it for five bucks a year or something, you know. So there's a, there's a little technicality that has, I mean, physically it's all, everything around it is CRA, but it might not technically be. So we need to either figure out whether something like what we did with the neighborhood signal boxes where it's some type of discretionary funds that y'all already have jurisdiction over, or if it can be somehow fitted into the CR. I, they're very interested in proceeding, and I thought you should be aware And the CRA of only goes as far as court. No, no further south than court. That's what I just said. 
there's there's the CRA core, and then there's an expanded CRA district that does come down a little bit further. Oh, okay. Um, but that expanded part isn't included in the project funding for the Bureau of Prisons. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So they're making a couple of wrinkles, but I just you know wanted y'all to be aware of it because it would be a super site, and it would the way the plan is worded, and I know that may get amended, but things that add to or enhance already existing cultural amenities are supposed to get, you know, kind of a, spe you know, a, a priority kind of a treatment because you're getting more bang for your product by bringing people there. So that's just so that you all are aware of that and hopefully if things are back on a regular schedule, I would hope to have help them make a presentation to you all maybe at the next, next meeting. Thank you, Beth. We've done some preliminary on, so thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions on the third quarter update for you? I got a comment. I'm kind of still off of what Neil said about that. Just as you were talking about the, uh, the mural and the interactive um, augmented reality, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be cool if you had an app that did an augmented reality work for each one of the artworks and then have an augmented reality stand where each of the artists actually can talk about their artwork? while they're looking at the app and when you're going strong. around the city and looking at it. Sure. As well as the pool augmented. So, and you said USF was doing the work for the mural? They're doing the initial mural work. Um, they For the augmented reality of actually getting the piece to change, they have to do a lot of scanning and mapping. Sure. But I think there's ways of that we'd be able to easily have an artist video or just a voiceover of, of right. the artist talking about sure. you know their particular their piece. piece. Yeah. I was just, I mean, my brain went to that because I'm like, well, the map would be great. You see where it actually looks at on, on the map itself, and then have, like, the artist standing next to them in the augmented reality. Oh, room. I see. Okay. About them talking about their piece and going, oh, here's this, and this is what this means. That'd be really interesting. Yeah, yeah the, that'd be the, really cool. The, it, it's a video, you know, so if the artist would, would agree to that, you know, as, yeah. as part of it, uh, Sculpture 360, you could be uh, sitting at a cafe, Yep. Looking at the piece, a little sign down below say, "Just tag me," and yep. you tag it, and you get a whole narrative of why it's there. Right, exactly. I mean, like just the just the picture that, that Beth brought up of the, uh, the, the the flower that was on the on the one box. I didn't even yeah, know that was actually. Was, that, yeah, I'm like, yeah, oh, I would have never known that. That's a fantastic that part of the, the historical right. piece of it, and the artist could explain that. Right. Yeah. So, since you got USF on the hook and their kids and their students, right. yeah. free labor, right. free smart labor. SBC yes. has a video department. Yeah, see, there we go. Keep it in, keep it in the side of the Pinellas. Right. There we go. Yeah. Well, well, when we're allowed to jump people, we'll, we'll jump. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay, um, review a staff update on the progress of Imagine Clearwater and the Memorial Causeway lighting project. So the first half, imagine Clearwater. Uh, we are in a stage to where the council is talking about the positioning of the band shell. Uh, there are some council members that would like to see it changed. Uh, and so city staff is working with the uh, designers, Stantec, to figure out what that would look like. Um, right now they're working at getting all of their budgetary numbers, decimal points dotted, I guess, uh, and... Um, Underscore lines, underscored, maybe? <laughs> it's just not decimal points, it's thousands. Or the, the commas, <laughs> so. yeah. Getting their commas added where, where uh, necessary. Um, so that project is basically where we saw it when we left mm -hmm. in March. Um, there is a special meeting on Tuesday of next week to actually discuss Imagine, and we'll see where we move from there. But the fortunate thing is... Um, in what we've seen so far, the movement of the uh, movement of the band shell would not affect a lot of the integration of the works on site that we had been working on previously, uh, which is great that we won't see ourselves um, playing catch up or having to transfer anything. Um, and the engineering department uh, for this particular project has been really great in inviting me to be part of that process and, and talking about um, you know where we're going to see things located and uh, how we how we want to see them and being part of the look and feel of that project as it evolved. Uh, so that's been really helpful. Um, for the lighting project, I made a presentation on uh, Thursday of last week to the council 
We have support to continue moving forward on that project. Uh, the budget is $1.6 million for it, but we're coming around in around $1.3 million. Uh, so we've got a lot of cost savings on it. Um, what this will do is, is light the piers and under deck of the bridge as it goes over the um, Clearwater Intracoastal. And it'll be LED lighting that's directly uh, focused on the structure so that there's not bleed over in the hopes that we're not uh, beaming any additional light onto Pierce 100 and hearing from uh, some disgruntled citizens there. Mm -hmm. uh, but this will be uh, remotely controlled. Um, it will tie into either the marina building or the back of house for the, uh, for the uh, amphitheater, uh, for the band shell rather. Um, and so if that does move, we might see some conduit extended out uh, to power the lights, but it won't uh, vastly change what's, what's out there. So this project can continue moving forward. Uh, like I said, we're at 60%. Uh, we're looking for uh, submitting plans to DOT in July, and that uh, we could begin construction as early as August on this particular project. So that's, that's moving forward really quickly. I think it will be a really impactful, um, beautiful vista out there. What's, uh, we're, we're working with DOT as they've learned a lot on the Skyway uh, that was installed down there. And at $1.6 million, this is just a fraction of the $15 million that the Skyway cost. Uh, so we're getting a lot of uh, nice savings from... Uh, or, I don't know if that was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the $13.4 million difference there. Um, but I think we will have a very beautiful um, causeway bridge. I did uh, want to bring up some of the renderings just to give you uh, a view of what the 60% uh, renderings look like. So here's a, a grayscale version. We see um, the underdeck lighting. Uh, I'm just going to move the mouse around. There are small pinpoint lights there, as well as a bank of lights that shines across the span. Uh, one of the particular, uh, particularly challenging things of this bridge is that the spans are so long, and they curve as they move more towards the, the, uh, the beach side. Uh, so that was very challenging uh, for them to map. But working with uh, Lumen Pulse is the same company that did the Skyway. They were able to figure out how to uh, situate and select the bulbs and housings to uh, have their angles be such that there isn't a drop-off of color or the effect of the light as it moves across. Um, and so we start to see a really, um, you know, intense uh, view of light, the uh, green being the, the middle, uh, as it gradient changes towards the middle anyways, um, and you really don't see much of a change or a drop uh, in the lighting as it moves across these spans. But as you get towards more of the color applications, it really uh, evens out and looks really beautiful. Uh, there's a purple one that they've done for us down this way, and it uh, just could be a really stunning view of what the bridge could look like at night. Um, these will be able to be controlled and changed by staff, uh, so we can see either a slow change of color over time or uh, static color. They can even do crazy flashing and pulsing, but I don't think either the Coast Guard or DRT would go for that. Um, but we you know, do have the capability of maybe at times when the bridge is closed uh, around 4th of July, when we can resume having 4th of July, um, seeing that somehow interact with the fireworks display and you know, be a part of a dynamic uh, presentation out at the site. And this will be for both sides of the bridge as well. And so we've got the uh, purple and blue gradient just on the underdeck. And let's see here. There's the underside of the bridge if really you're beautiful. standing. Uh, so we're really excited about working on this project and glad that it's moving along and not being slowed down by some of the discussion of the other Imagine Clearwater sites. Chris, who determines the colors? Uh, that's the city's control. 
Um, so we'll be able to decide, you know, do we want to change them up for holidays or do we want them to um, have like a set pattern? We'll be able to basically dial in whatever color if we want for 4th of July to have it go red, white, and blue across. We'll have that uh, ability to do that. Timeline? Uh, by August, we, well, we're submitting in July for the D final DOT permits. The permitting process has been going on since February, I believe. Um, so each reiteration of the um, design, we submit for you know an updated review. Um, and so July, we'll submit for those final reviews. We hope that as early as August, we might be able to begin construction. Uh, and construction could take uh, three to four months as far as getting everything set up on site. That is, fingers crossed, assuming we don't need to change any of the conduit uh, location or extend that out any further. Neat. Any other questions? Very good. Okay, moving right along, we've got uh, old business items. Uh, 5.1 is review current public art and design board discretionary fund balance. Uh, the fund balance is $92,215. Uh, so some of the upcoming expenses we have are the $1,000 uh, for the two extended loans of sculptures uh, out at Cleveland Street. Um, the phase, uh, I'm sorry, Cleveland Street season 10 uh, is $9,000. That'll be in September of this year. Uh, and those are the only uh, outgoing um, forecasted expenses for the foreseeable future. Uh, potential incoming uh, funds include uh, potential from the Clearwater Gas Project to resupplement that fund. I've been working with the assistant city manager to try and identify funding sources for two different reasons. Uh, one is to set up a separate maintenance account for our sculptures and programs. This would not draw from um, our existing discretionary fund where we're currently pulling funds from. Uh, and we'd be able to put money in each year and have that money continue on over the course of years so that we'd be able to take care of any larger maintenance projects in the future. Right now, I've suggested to him about fifteen dollars to $20,000 per year um, that we'd be able to include as far as repair and replacement costs for our projects. Uh, and so we're looking into um, an annual allocation for that. Secondly, um, I'm also working with him to identify some non-project-based dependable streams for replenishing the discretionary fund uh, main account separate from the maintenance that will be able to depend on that. Previously, we used to rely on the private development programs in lieu of fees uh, to go towards that program budget, but now we don't have it aside from a voluntary program. Uh, and so this would give some dependable funding towards uh, replenishing that uh, budget over time as well. Um, so he and I are both working, uh, trying to locate some finance, uh, financial streams of revenue from that. Um, one of the things that I asked for is potentially the red light camera fees uh, to go towards that. And that way, uh, my rationale was that uh, you know something that is done for safety of the city, as far as people uh, discouraging people from running red lights, is going towards uh, beautification within the city and improving quality of life. So yeah. uh, I checked the revenue <laughs> manual. <laughs> it doesn't have any restrictions on it, so we'll see what comes back uh, for that one. Clever. Um, but yeah, that'll, that'll give us a little more flexibility in the future, not have to worry about diminishing the project fund too much over time, especially now that we've got our grants program uh, that we can support community-driven uh, projects as well. Any uh, other questions on that one? Okay. Uh, item 5.2 is review a staff update on the FYI Community Partnership Inc. Public Art Initiative. And so that was uh, Miranda had come to our meeting in March um, uh, to update us on that uh, project. The council approved it unanimously on June the 4th. So uh, we will be producing a, uh, a check for Miranda to 
do her public art out at the site. She'll stay in contact with us and bring us their uh, final design for that uh, before it's created. Um, that uh, she's working with Yala Ford, who's a, a muralist, um, actually a multi uh, multimedia artist uh, that works in a bunch of different disciplines, uh, to the do the design and the community uh, partnership for that project. Uh, this will be in the uh, Lake Bellevue community which is, like Beth said, is one of the um, areas that's underserved as far as public art funding or public art projects right now. And we're hoping that uh, partnering with the community to create some of their own projects out of the site will start to bridge that gap uh, in the hopes that we have some city-initiated artwork in the future down there as well. Uh, let's see, that is that item. Uh, five, oh, any further questions on that one? Item 5.3 is review a staff update on the repair of the public artwork at US 19 and Gulf to Bay Boulevard. So I'm working on, uh, uh, working with District 7, uh, the DOT office over in Tampa, to locate the building construction plans for this, uh, to determine what the rope lighting uh, that was added underneath the bridge is, so that we can replace that out. Um, I had talked to them about the maintenance agreement that we have with them, and they said, well, we can't find that right now. Uh, and so the request is, please find it, and if you can't find it, we'd like for you to cover the expense of changing out the lighting out there and maintaining it. Uh, so we'll see where that progresses to. Uh, when I talked with our traffic operations manager, he said, well, why aren't they maintaining it? And I said, well, that's a great question. So we're going to find out what that is and hopefully not have to access the discretionary funds to change the lights out. Um, in looking through the original project budgets and the notebooks that I've got on this, the, fortunately the lighting was not extremely expensive. I think it was $8,200 for the rope lighting out there, which at that time was probably oh, at least Eight years ago, I think at this point it was probably 2011 or 2012 uh, that we put those in there. And I think the LEDs have probably become more affordable since then. So if we do have to bear the cost of putting the lights uh, or buying new lights out there, it will not be uh, an uncomfortable burden too much. Yes, I, I saw in the, uh, I couldn't make the last meeting, but I saw in the minutes that it was actually uh, viewed as a city obligation. That was what it was originally, and when I uh, talked, or, or rather, that's what I viewed it to be, but when I was talking with the traffic operations manager, he didn't recall that being um, something that he had said okay to. Was there a joint participation agreement? It might be that, and so um, that... Dictated in that. So um, that's what we're trying to find. Obviously, yeah, that's the, that's the key. Um, amenities, typically... Uh, DOT tries to push that responsibility onto the local government. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would I would suggest to you that, and I, I appreciate the information on the on the cost of the lights. Mm -hmm. That's not the cost. Sure. The cost is really the maintenance of traffic to install right. in that corridor at night. Right. And uh, you'll probably be spending um, hundreds of thousands you know, in $100,000 to put up $10,000 worth of uh, material. So um, just keep that in okay. mind and certainly try and make sure that it's DOT doing the work because that there's nothing easy about working in that intersection. No, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. I will uh, I'll keep up with it and see where we can get even, to. Even, you know, talk to talk to the city and say, we'd love to pay for the new rope light. <laughs> yeah. You install. Right. <laughs> we'll give them to you to install. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good tactic. I will, uh, <laughs> I will do yeah. what I can with that. Yep. And perhaps we can get our, um, our um, municipal planning organization or the uh, MPO uh, to assist us with that as yeah. well. Um, all right, uh, and then item five, oh, sorry, any other questions on that one? Um, item 5.4 is review a staff update uh, on an inquiry regarding the public art maximum required expenditure cap for city capital improvement projects. Uh, the current update on that one is no new update. Uh, the city attorney is still um, evaluating that and 
will get back to us as far as a determination. Uh, for the current time, uh, there is not any pushback against considering um, Imagine Clearwater a legacy project and not a capital project, which would give us uh, probably about six hundred some odd thousand dollars of public art funding for that, rather than the two hundred thousand cap. Uh, so that is some good news there, and I'll continue to follow up on that project in particular. Good, excellent. Man. All right. Um, just one thing in the director's report, I wanted to uh, give you an update on. Uh, recently, I would say in the last week or so. There was a public art project in Boynton Beach that uh, the I'm trying to figure out. I've looked through their public art board minutes, and I can't find where it might have changed at any point. So it might have happened within the city's internal structure, whether it's the fire chief or the public art manager. Um, but the project was changed and altered to where um, two significant uh, African-American um, firefighters were altered in the photograph. And they were kind of like their faces were turned into some weird composite face that didn't reflect who they, uh, who they looked like when other, um, other members of the firefighting team were clearly recognizable. Uh, and so they're trying to figure out uh, where that happened at some point. But I just wanted to reiterate that um, you know, as your public art uh, program coordinator, that um, you know, I'm I'm cognizant of these kind of things, and I want to make sure that uh, you know, you know that if there are alterations to any project, that they'll be coming through the public art board, uh, and they won't be handled at the staff level. Uh, that's a matter of that it's a public function uh, as far as where we select and what our pieces will look like. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I just wanted to reiterate my commitment to you that uh, you won't see something like that change, um, you know, uh, here in Clearwater. Uh, so um, I just felt with the you know, current climate right now and uh, with things being newsworthy over across the state, particularly in the public art field, I just wanted to, to bring that up. Appreciate that. Thanks. We appreciate your diligence. Welcome. Uh, so that's... Uh, all of my items. Um, are there any board members that have anything else that they would like to bring up? Anything that needs to be heard? Going once, going twice? All right. Well, thank you very much. We're going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.